is our brains, we control our brains. I know sometimes you're like, my brain is not on. You can turn it on, just tell it on, brain. Then on. Right? You control your brain. So we tell our brain, signal to our brain, hey, I want to remember this. And the way that we as humans naturally signal to our brain, we want to remember something, is a couple of things. One, we focus. Two, some of us write it. Some of us type it in our phones. So whatever you're, so you have to know yourself as a learner, but whatever it is that signals to your brain, hey, I want to remember this. And the second thing you must do is tell your brains, I want to remember this name. Have you ever asked someone their name, got it, and then turned the corner and forgot it two seconds later? It's because you didn't tell your brain I want to remember this. Your brain hears, so, especially in higher education, you hear so much information. And we got to tell our brain, this one's important, remember this name. So first, ask for the name. Secondly, signal to your brain you want to remember. Try to remember it, write it down. I'm a writer. So when I learn people's names, I write it down. I'm also a geospatial kind of learner. So I got to remember that Kevin is right there and that Penny's right there and that Dr. J is over there. And now I can just go to those folks in those places. If they get to move, I know who they are, so that's okay. Mm -hmm. Right? Geospatial learners. Second thing, you have to tell your brain that you want to use it. And the third and final thing is this. What we know is that we do not remember or hold on to anything that we do not use immediately. The shorter the element we want to remember, the sooner we have to use it. So reverse what you would think. So names are relatively short. If you want to remember them, on average, you got to use it within 90 seconds of getting it. So your name is Lester. So I'd say, hi, your name is Lester. Nice to meet you, Lester. See, I just used it. Lester, that's a great looking jacket. Lester, are you having a good time at NASPA? That's great. Take care, Lester. I've used it four times. I'm going to know Lester. Lester, we're Facebook friends right now. Right? <laughs> Matter of fact, got to get it. Tell your brain you want to remember it and then repeat it. Can't build belonging without knowing students' names. You also can't help students feel like a sense of belonging in higher education if they themselves feel defeated, not apart. So there are a couple things I think we can do in higher education. We can normalize marginalizing experiences. Normalize. Marginalizing experiences. Do you not know that students are always the ones who think they're the only ones who failed the test? They're the only ones who failed the quiz. They're the only ones who weren't selected by the fraternity sorority. They're the only ones who broke up. They're the only ones, you know. And what we have to do is help them understand you're not the only one. That's not to say you're not the only one, get over it. It's to normalize that experience. That part of being in college is you're going to have some ups, you're going to have some downs, you're going to do very well in some courses, you're going to have some courses you're going to not do so well in. And in fact, I often encourage audiences like these to dare to be vulnerable. That is, to tell your own story. Now, I'm not saying bleed all over the students. Like, you know what, in second grade I lost my tooth, and in fourth grade my best friend dumped me, and in sixth grade I lost my boyfriend, I'm a loser, and I, I don't even know why I work here. That doesn't help anybody. <laughs> but if you simply tell them about a time where you turned adversity into success, success students often think that those of us in higher education are perfect. You ever seen them in the store? Met them at the mall, they're like, oh, you were at Macy's. Because there isn't a student affairs shopping center somewhere. We don't get our own shopping center. We gotta go to the same stores as everybody else, right? Because they, they have very high expectations of them, of us, and we should have high expectations of them. We can help normalize, marginalizing experience. Let them know that what they're going through is absolutely what college students go through and that they can still be successful at the end of it. Help them rewrite negative scripts. Students walk into your office all the time saying things like, I won't succeed, I won't pass this test, I won't be selected, I won't graduate. And the psychological, the psychology of that um, scenario is this, that if you keep telling yourself you won't, you won't. But the moment you tell yourself that you can, you can. Good colleague, Carol Dweck, has a book called Mindsets. It introduces two mindsets, fixed and growth mindsets. Uh, Carol says most people have fixed mindsets. What we need to develop are growth mindsets, where people believe that success is a function of development. Success is a function of their effort. But she also speaks to us as practitioners and as educators about what we can do. And what we can do is stop praising talent over effort. Yeah. So rather than saying, oh my gosh, you're amazing. Oh, that was a great meeting. You're just a spectacular person. Tell them you worked hard and planned the meeting and your hard, good work paid off. It's clear that you threw yourself into this assignment. It's clear that you threw yourself into this event. And that's why so many people turned out and look at the evaluations, they're soaring. Not you're just so awesome and cool, right? Because we start celebrating effort 
and pointing students' directions, their attention to effort, then they'll start thinking that's how not only to get to success, but they'll also be driven, motivated to be effortful in the future. Despite all those challenges, I still think the future of this profession is quite bright. I've talked about my research, I've talked about the center, I've talked about Ohio State, I've talked about the students I've met over the years. I've talked about some things I've done in some of my previous talks, but I want to close on a more personal note. And, you know, I could talk about everything that I have shared. Let me just show you these things. We're going to skip over all of the stuff you just got. I promise you. This is the highest marginalized experience of all of this. Um, we're going to come back to that. Um, I want to close with this idea of the future. So we have challenges in our profession. And they're great. But I'm still optimistic about the future because I think that we can get there. And in fact, um, my maternal grandmother talked about her earlier. She was the one, the woman of faith who said, you know, let's have the surgery. I think he can live. I'm so glad she decided to do that. My maternal grandmother, her name is Priola Evelyn Warner. She was born October 6, 1925. She was a teacher. She taught for 50 years. <laughs> Then retired and taught for another 30 years. <laughs> I mean, she just taught all her life. I mean, she, growing up, she lived in Trenton, North Carolina. You know what the Piggly Wiggly is? Yeah. You go to the Piggly Wiggly with my grandmother, and when you walk inside the door, the person, the greeter, says, Miss Warner, you're my second grade teacher. You go to the meat section, and the meat cutter says, Miss Warner, you're my fourth grade teacher. As you check out of the Piggly Wiggly, the woman who works the cash register said, Miss Warner, you taught me in sixth grade. I taught my son in second grade. At some point, I thought North Carolina had no other teachers than my grandma. <laughs> it seemed like she taught everybody. She was a master teacher. I'm not simply saying that she was a master teacher. This is a designation that was given to her by her school district, given her years of experience and the success that she had achieved. She would teach me things like, thank you. But she's a master teacher because she would teach me things like, she would say, Rail, that's what she would call me, Rail. She never called me to Rail my entire life. She'd say, Rail, now listen, get all the education you can, and then can all the education you get. And I told this story, University of New Leaving Unnamed, and the gentleman at the end of my talk came to me and said, your grandmother's real selfish, I almost punched her. You know what I'm talking about, right? I said, why do you say my grandmother's selfish? She said, because your grandmother said, get all the education you can, and then can all the education you get. Don't you know that education is to be shared? It's supposed to be given to empower other people. I said, oh, you don't know my grandmother. My grandmother had a garden, and in her garden, she pulled up all of her vegetables and canned them just right, under the right pressure, the right heat, preserved them so that they were ready for sharing with others. Her whole point is get all the education you can and then get it right so you can can it, so you can give it to other people. It is about sharing, but get it right for people. Get it right. My grandmother would tell me sometimes, she'd say, Rel, get all the education you can and Rel, love everybody, love many. I wrote it in the cover of the Belonging book. She said, but trust few. Learn to paddle your own canoe. Give me lots of lessons. I love my maternal grandmother. still do. Young person growing up, I was so in love with her. Sometimes I would be motivated to get out of bed before my sisters and brothers did, just so I had a couple minutes with my grandmother before the rest of the world woke up. So I would get out of bed. I'd tiptoe to the kitchen because she was always in there singing and making breakfast. And I'd watch her from the distance like a little creep. <laughs> It's so funny, I'd be in there, I'd be like, hold my breath, and trying to draw real soft with socks on. She'd say, Well, come on in here, I can hear you breathing. <laughs> I got quiet time with my grandma. My grandma said, uh, Rel, do you know the song um, Amazing Grace? I said, No, I don't know that song. She said, It's real simple, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Save the rich like me. She would sing it. Now, when she was younger, back in the 40s and the 50s, she had a really powerful voice. She was saying at churches all over the place. Um, but as she got older, her voice got more windy. Another morning, I'd wake up and see my groom. She'd say, well, do you know the song? There's not a friend like the lovely Jesus. No, not. And she'd get excited, scrambling eggs, singing the song. I'm about seven years old. My grandmother one morning said to me, well, do you know this song? It's one of my favorite songs. I said, is it your favorite? One of your favorites? She said, actually, that's my favorite song. She never said that to me, ever. She had one favorite song. This was it. 
She said, now this song is real simple. The words are, there's a bright side somewhere. There's a bright side somewhere. <clears throat> Don't you give up until you find it. <clears throat> There's a bright side somewhere. There's a bright side.
And the nurse came in that night. She said, you look so tired. Are you going to go to bed? I said, I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to sit right here beside my grandmother. She said, I can bring in a cot if you want. I said, no, I just want to stay right here in this chair next to, close to, proximity to the things that matter most. My grandmother and hold her hand. I did it that night. It was November 21st. Got up November 22nd. I did the whole thing all over again. My grandmother wet herself. I took care of every single problem. No problem. Her favorite singer was Shirley Caesar, Dr. J. And so I had Shirley Caesar playing on my iPhone. Normally, whenever my grandmother heard Shirley Caesar, her foot would start tapping. But in the hospital, my grandmother's foot didn't tap. I knew then there's another sign that my grandmother's on her way gone. Went to bed that night. The nurse came in and said, please, would you please just take a cot? You look so tired. And I know your back has got to be aching. I said, no, stay right here. Hold my grandmother's hand. I drifted off to sleep. And I was awakened out of my sleep by the most violent shaking of my grandmother's hand I'd ever felt in my life. When I felt her hand, I looked at the clock and it was 1.17 a.m. And I looked at the hand and I looked at my grandmother and she was just staring at me. I didn't know what was going on, so I reached without looking. I tried to reach for the button to call the nurse and hit the television on. And I tried to hit another button. There's a phone. I can't really find it. And as my brain, my mind, my focus is off of my grandmother looking for how I call the nurse, I feel the shaking in my hand. I turn around and said, Mom, are you okay? She says, hey, Press the button for the nurse. I'm waiting for her to come. And while my head is in orbit from the button to call the nurse back to my grandmother, she goes, there's a bright side. Somewhere. She's singing my favorite song. She hasn't said a word in weeks. She doesn't know her own name, her daughter's name, the president's name. She doesn't know what day of the week it is. She's singing her favorite song, and I just, in all my clothes on the floor, I said, there's a bright side somewhere. Don't you give up until you find there We all have some 